Let's turn in the scriptures to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to read the first 17 verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Let me read, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, and live, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the uh, peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. A text uh, the South Noon Brethren is the 12th and 13th uh, verses of this uh, 12th chapter of Hebrews. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but, ra- but let it rather be healed. One of the most enthralling events recorded in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress involves Christian and hopeful who, on account of the difficulty of the King's Highway, were tempted to depart from that highway and to enter into a field known as Bypath Meadow. Bypath Meadow was attractive, but it resulted in Christian and Hopeful falling into the hands of giant despair and their ultimate imprisonment in Doubting Castle. Bunyan describes what occurred in these terms. He says, Now I beheld in my dream that they had not journeyed far, but the river and the way for a time parted, at which they were not a little sorry. Yet they did not dare to go out of the way. Now the way from the river was rough, and their feet tender by reason of their travels. So the souls of the pilgrims were much discouraged because of the way. Wherefore, still as they went on, they wished for a better day. Uh, now, a little before them, there was on the left, left hand of the road a meadow and a stile to go over into it, and that meadow is called Bypath Meadow. Then said Christian to his fellow, If this meadow lies along by, by our wayside, 
Let's go over into it. Then he went to the stile to see, and behold, a path lay by the way on the other side of the fence. It is according to my wish, said Christian. Here is the easiest way going, the easiest go way to go. Come, good hopeful, and let us go over. Uh, however, if you read on in uh, Pilgrim's Progress, you discover that Hopeful was not so sure about this because he goes on to say, but what if this path should lead us out of the way? Uh, to that, Christian confidently replied, that is not likely. Look, does it not long go along by the wayside? And so we're told that Hopeful, being persuaded by his fellow, went after him over the stile. And when they were gone over and they were got into the path, they found it very easy for their feet. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Pilgrim's Progress, you'll know that uh, having crossed into Bypath Meadow, uh, darkness soon descended upon uh, that meadow. And as darkness fell, so also a violent storm arose with the result that the Christian and Hopeful lost their way. Uh, Realising the danger that they were in, uh, they attempted to make their way back to the stile and to the king's highway, but they were unable to do that, and so they were compelled to spend the night in the open field. Unbeknown to them, their confusion had accidentally caused them to stumble onto the grounds of Doubting Castle, which was the home of giant despair. And so it was that in the morning, uh, giant despair found them and imprisoned them in his castle. And there in Doubting Castle, Christian and Hopeful endured suffering and affliction, which resulted in their being overwhelmed by doubt and despondency and fear. And it appeared that it would be no, there could be no escape for them. It wasn't, however, until Christian remembered that he had in his possession a key, a key called Promise, a key that actually opened every door of Doubting Castle that they were unable to escape and return to the King's Highway. Christian and Hopeful's imprisonment in Doubting Castle is descriptive of the doubt, despondency and fear that so often confronts us as believers in the Christian life. Uh, and those doubts, despondency and fear often encounter us in the midst of the trials and the sufferings and afflictions of this life. Doubt, despondency and fear in a certain sense lie at the very heart of uh, our text this evening. Our text concerns the doubt, despondency and fear that specifically arises from suffering and affliction. And as we saw this morning, uh, suffering and affliction are all too frequent but often unwelcome companions that we encounter as we run uh, the race that is set before us. Uh, though redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ, though efficaciously called by the Spirit of God, and though we are the recipients of the blessings of God, when we rightly experience God's chastening hand upon us, the joy and contentment of the Christian life tends to quickly fade, and we can find ourselves in some very dark places. And along with Christian and hopeful, we can find ourselves imprisoned in the dungeon of Doubting Castle. And just as doubt, despondency and fear took hold of Christian and hopeful, uh, so too those same things can take hold of us when we endure God's chastening hand upon us. Instead of recognising and submitting to the correction of our Heavenly Father, we actually chafe under his corrective hand. What is in fact uh, for our spiritual and eternal good, we interpret to be for our hurt and destruction. In such an environment, despondency and fear tend to take hold of us, which in turn 
leads to our hands hanging down and our knees becoming feeble. That's the language, of course, of our text this evening. What's the result of our hands hanging down and our knees becoming feeble? Well, again, in the language of our text, we actually cease to run the race that is set before us. And so, as an encouragement to us to continue uh, to run the race that's set before us, uh, we look at this text this evening. Entitled the message, Weary Hands and Feeble Knees. And look firstly at the remedial action, secondly the potential danger, and finally the fundamental need. Uh, you would have noticed as we read here in chapter 12 of Hebrews, that in verses 5 through 11 of this chapter, the writer of the Hebrews reminds the Hebrew Christians, uh, to whom of course he was writing, that God chastens every son and daughter whom he receives. That is, he corrects those who belong to him and who by his grace have been adopted into his family. And the writer to the Hebrews' point is that the suffering and affliction that the Hebrew Christians were enduring, a suffering and affliction which was painfully real, did not arise by accident, but that suffering and affliction had, uh, as we reminded ourselves even this morning, had been sent by God. The writer to the Hebrews reminds his readers that through their suffering and affliction, God was actually correcting and teaching them just as an earthly father disciplines and corrects his son or his daughter. And furthermore, the writer to the Hebrews also reminds his readers that the suffering and affliction that they are enduring was not an indication of God's wrath or of his anger. Quite the contrary, it was the reflection of his tender love and care for them. As he declares in verse 7 of this chapter, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son, he says, is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And now in verse 12, the writer of the Hebrews goes on to exhort his readers and us along with them uh, in these terms. He says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Wherefore, wherefore, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees? Wherefore, wherefore, of course, means on account of. Uh, wherefore, on account of the fact that your suffering and affliction has been sent by your he heavenly Father. Wherefore, because those things that have, uh, have come have come from the hand of a loving God, Wherefore, because those things are not designed to discourage you, not designed to drive you into despondency and fear. Wherefore, because your suffering and affliction serve your higher spiritual and eternal good. Wherefore, because your, your chastening is designed, in fact, to strengthen and equip you to run the race that is set before you. Wherefore, says the writer to the Hebrews, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Lift up literally the hanging beside hands, those hands that have drooped on account of your suffering and affliction and on account of the spiritual weariness that has overtaken you. Lift them up, raise them up. Don't let your hands hang down by your side. And do the same with respect to your feeble knees, your feeble or weak knees those knees that are buckled under the pressures of your suffering and affliction, those knees that don't feel like moving and have become stiff under the weight and burdens of life. Strengthen those feeble knees. Lift them up. Exercise them. Build them up. Get them moving again. These exhortations are premised on the fact that there had been some failure on the part of the Hebrew Christians to continually uh, run the race that had been set before them. And they'd failed to run that race that had been set before them, specifically here on account of their sufferings and afflictions. 
And so these exhortations assume, as was the case, that the sufferings and afflictions endured by the Hebrew Christians had taken a spiritual toll on them. And that spiritual toll is figuratively described here as their hands hanging down and their feet, their knees becoming weak and feeble. These exhortations are noteworthy in light of some who claim today that uh, a Christian, when one becomes a Christian, uh, all of our problems uh, disappear. Now, there are those who teach, erroneously teach, uh, that all a Christian has to do is to have a su sufficient measure of faith and all will be well. Uh, so that if you have enough faith, your life will be free from difficulties. But plainly, that's not the teaching. That's plainly not the teaching of Scripture, nor is it a true description of the Christian life. Uh, one only needs to reflect for a very short while on the book of uh, Job to discover the fallacy of such thinking. Indeed, a consideration of the Old Testament saints listed in the previous chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews 11, also exposes uh, the error of such teaching. The uh, preceding verses, in fact, to our text also expose uh, the error of such teaching. Just recall for a moment what we read there in verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, what, what does it say? He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastens not? And again in verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. It's evident that the Christian life is not free uh, from trial and tribulation. If we are adopted sons and daughters of God, if we belong to the family of God, then we should expect to be chastened by our Heavenly Father. And this means as a Christian we will endure suffering and affliction. We will encounter trials and tribulations. That is a description of the Christian life. That's what is to be expected. If we don't experience a trial and tribulation in our life, then that's an indication that in fact we are not one of God's children. We're not one of his sons and daughters. We don't belong to the family of God. And as a consequence, we will not enjoy uh, the eternal inheritance and privileges of God's sons and daughters. As Christians, uh, we will experience uh, chastisement. We will experience uh, the correcting hand of our Heavenly Father. And that correcting hand at times comes in the form of suffering and affliction. And that suffering and affliction at times will prove to be extremely painful and difficult to bear. That's what the writer to the Hebrews even says in verse 11. He says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. And by that he means uh, it will be heavy, painful. And the effect of such suffering and affliction on many sons and daughters, including our souls, is that our spiritual hands will hang down and our spiritual knees will become feeble. Hence the exhortation of the text. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. These metaphors concerning hands and feet uh, are drawn, you might uh, have noticed, from verse 3 of Isaiah 35. In Isaiah 35 verse 3 we read, Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Just by way of explanation, Isaiah 35 and verse 3 is set against the background of the threat that the Assyrians posed to the children of Judah. It appeared as though the power of Assyria would overwhelm Judah and that the covenant promises of God to Judah would of necessity fail. And as a consequence, the children of Judah in general were greatly discouraged and fearful. And Isaiah 35 verse 3 forms part 
of the Lord's encouragement to the discouraged and distressed in Judah. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. The children of Judah had weak hands and they had feeble knees. It should, it should also be noted that the two metaphors, that is the metaphors concerning hands and feet, are also linked to the metaphor uh, that is to be found in the very first verse of this 12th chapter, uh, that metaphor being a metaphor concerning the running of a race. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And the connection is along this lines. Uh, a runner's arms are essential to his running. And, and by pumping his arms as he runs, a runner provides himself uh, with additional momentum to propel his body forward. His arms functioning in a way not dissimilar uh, to a piston in an engine. And the runner whose hands and arms hang limply by his side loses a vital source of momentum and is consequently hindered in his running. And likewise, a runner whose knees are weak or feeble is also severely compromised in his ability to run. Now, the Greek word translated in the KJV here, feeble, means literally palsy. And palsy is a bodily condition marked by a loss of power to feel controlled movement. And the effect of, a, of palsy would be to weaken and to debilitate a person. And so literally here, what the writer of the Hebrews says is, lift up the uh, palsy knee, lift up the uh, weak, the powerless uh, knees. Uh, and again here, the connection with the running of a race is obvious. A runner's knees in conjunction, in conjunction with his legs provides the primary source of strength uh, for a runner. And when a runner has feeble knees, his ability to run is seriously compromised. And so here, the exhortation is to lift up, uh, to strengthen uh, those feeble knees. What's being described here uh, by the reference to the uh, hands that hang down and to these uh, weak knees? Well, the hands which hang down and the feeble knees uh, metaphorically describe the spiritual weakness and inertia that we as Christians experience when we are overwhelmed by the afflictions and sufferings that our Heavenly Father sends our way. The hands which hang down and the feeble knees are descriptive of the despondency and fear that uh, so often even overcomes Christians uh, in the Christian life. Uh, it's descriptive really of what occurred uh, to Christian and hopeful uh, when they languished in Dowling Castle. And as Christians, we're not infrequently those who suffer from hands that hang down and weak knees. What do hands which hang down and feeble knees look like in the Christian life? Well, those conditions manifest themselves in a variety of ways. They manifest themselves in a fire to consistently use the means of grace. When we don't consistently use the means of grace, there we see an example of hands that hang down and feeble knees. We see it also when our prayer life becomes essentially inactive, where perhaps we pray, but we don't spend much time in prayer, or if we do pray, uh, we simply want to get it over and done with and move on. Uh, this uh, weak hands, or these weak hands and feeble knees, is reflected also in a lack of interest in the reading of the Word of God, in our inattention or our indifference to the preached Word, in our lifeless, indifferent Christianity, in our formal outward worship, a worship that's devoid of love for God and a love for Jesus Christ. Uh, it's to be seen in, in, in our worship where we simply go through the motions. It's to be seen also in our unwillingness at times to confront our spiritual enemies. It's to be seen in at times even when we come to a place where Effectively, we abandon the faith, seen in our indifference to sin, in our refusal to address sin in our lives, 
in our failure to confess our sins and to repent of those sins, a giving of ourselves over to sin, is to be seen in our refusal to trust in the Lord, our failure to embrace the promises of God, our failure to adorn our profession of faith, is to be seen in our looking to self for strength, in our self-centeredness, our self-reliance, is to be seen in our despising of the fellowship and communion of the saints. Now these are, these are just some of the ways, brethren, in which weak knees, or weak hands rather, and feeble knees manifest themselves in our lives. What causes those conditions to arise? One thing that generates those conditions is our failure or refusal to recognise that our sufferings and our afflictions actually come from the hand of a loving Heavenly Father. So that instead of recognising those things for what they are, we view them as grievous and distasteful and as serving no good purpose. And when we view our sufferings and afflictions that way, the natural tendency is for our hands to hang down and our knees to become feeble. We begin to feel sorry for ourselves. We uh, conclude that we are being harshly dealt with. And we, furthermore, we conclude that God does not love us, he does not care for us, that he is unjustly afflicting us. This is a sad uh, but all too frequent spiritual reality for believers. At the very time when we need to be vigorously exercised in spiritual things in order to cope with our sufferings and afflictions, instead we become overwhelmed by those same sufferings and afflictions and we take our place alongside Christian and hopeful in the dungeon of Doubting Castle. Our hands hang down and our knees become feeble. Our sufferings and afflictions prove too much for us. Our appetite for the Christian life uh, gradually dissipates with the result that we cease running the race that has been set before us. Indeed, if our doubts and our fears become too great, it's not a matter of ceasing to run, but we simply cannot run uh, the race that has been set before us. Our hearts and minds, instead of looking in faith to Jesus Christ for strength, uh, for the courage that we need, turn inward. And as we do that, and as we look to our souls, and as we look to our own strength, uh, it is then that we realise that we have no answers. And so doubt and despondency set in. We become fatigued and exhausted, spiritually incapacitated. The future looks bleak. We know that we ought to press on in faith, but we're unable to stand, let alone to run. Hanging down hands and feeble knees depicted the condition in which the Hebrew Christians found themselves. Remember, this was as a result of the sufferings and afflictions that God himself had sent. And moreover, those sufferings and afflictions were actually sent in love and they were sent for the spiritual and eternal good of the Hebrew Christians. But because the Hebrew Christians had not viewed their sufferings and afflictions as coming from the hand of a loving Heavenly Father, their hands had begun to hang down and their knees had become weak. In the words of verse 13 of our text, they had become lame. In fact, they had become so debilitated that they were in danger of being turned out of the way, turned aside 
in the language of Pilgrim's Progress, turned aside from the King's Highway, as was the case with Christian and Hopeful. Now, brethren, all around us, we encounter believers whose hands are hanging down and whose knees have become feeble. And those who are suffering from that condition are not just in other churches, but we actually experience those things ourselves. We experience them here in our own congregation. We know that we should be running. We know that we should be running the race. But at times in the Christian life, under the pressures and the trials of life, under the afflictions and sufferings that we endure, we feel so overwhelmed, so discouraged uh, by the things that come upon us that it is as though we simply uh, can't go on. Our hands hang down, our knees become feeble. And so this condition is a condition that ought to be of concern to each of us here this evening. The truth is, that all of us are weak and frail creatures. If we understand ourselves and have any conception of ourselves, we will realise that there is very little strength in any of us. We only need to be put into the right situation, under the right measure of pressure, to find that our hands very quickly hang down and our knees have become exceedingly weak. How ought we to view those who are struggling in this way? The answer is with pity and compassion. We are to be those who bear one another's burdens. It's true also, of course, that we are... Uh, by the grace of God, to seek to restore uh, those who are spiritually uh, struggling. And when we see someone whose hands are hanging down and whose knees are weak, uh, we ought not to lose sight of the fact that there is something spiritually amiss. The hands hanging down and the feeble knees uh, may well be symptomatic of other uh, spiritual shortcomings. Remedial action is required. You see, the Lord's purpose in uh, sending uh, suffering and affliction is actually not to weaken us, but to strengthen us. Our trials and our afflictions are designed to enable us to run the race that is set before us and to run that race to completion. And so therefore, by God's grace and with his help, uh, we are to lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. And they well may be our hands and it may well be that it's our knees that are weak. Uh, how are we to go about that? We to look to Jesus Christ. We to look to Jesus Christ and to seek His help and assistance. It's not in our souls. We don't have the ability to actually lift up our hands, which hang down, and our feeble knees. What we have to do is to, we have to look at those things that the Lord sends across our path. We have to see those things for what they are. We have to recognise them for what they are. They, whether we realise it or not, are actually expressions of his love. We need to remind ourselves of what God is doing in and through those events and circumstances in our lives. We need to look beyond our immediate circumstances, beyond our present suffering and affliction. We need to see what God is actually doing and what the end of what he's doing is. And as we do that, we ought to take heart. We ought to be spiritually invigorated 
by the realisation of what God is actually doing in our lives and what purpose those afflictions and those sufferings uh, are, are used for. And as we do that, brethren, as we, as we come to a realisation that these things are not haphazard events in our lives, they're not things that are just simply out of control, but they're actually sent by the hand of a loving Heavenly Father, sent by him in order to train us, to shape us, to fashion us, to bring us into compliance with his word. Uh, as, as we see that, as we recognise that, then by God's grace we are enabled to press on and to run the race that is actually set before us. By God's grace, we are enabled to lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Note that we are not only to lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, but we're also exhorted here to make straight paths for our feet. That's verse 13. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down on the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Straight paths. Straight paths here refers to those paths that are upright, that are not crooked. The reference is to paths that are smooth and free from obstacles. And the writer of the Hebrews calls his readers to remove all obstacles out of the way so as to avoid the possibility of stumbling and falling as they run the race that is set before them. The words make straight paths for our feet appear to be taken from uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 26. There in Proverbs 4, uh, Solomon counsels his son in these terms. He says, Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. And so Solomon there exhorts his son to a single-minded adherence to the path of righteousness. And that is the sense also of the writer to the Hebrews uh, here when he exhorts his readers and when he exhorts us to make straight paths for our feet. He is exhorting us to walk in upright ways, in ways that accord with the mind and the will of God, to walk in the ways of truth and holiness. Now that's the exhortation. And again, the question arises, how do we do that? How do we make a path that is smooth and free from obstacles? The truth is that, is that in and of our souls, we cannot lift up the hands that hang down. We can't strengthen the feeble knees nor can we make straight paths for our feet. But we need all those things to be addressed if we are to run the race that is actually set before us and if we're not to stumble and fall. The truth is, if those things are not addressed, the likelihood is that the one who is weak in faith, who is overwhelmed by their sufferings and afflictions, will actually be turned out of the way. They'll be uh, enticed to abandon the race. In the case of the Hebrew Christians, that it would have meant them abandoning their Christian profession and returning to Judaism, apostatizing from the faith. And for them, that was a real possibility. It remains a real possibility even for believers today. There's a very real temptation for those who are weak in faith and who are confronted by suffering and affliction to be inclined to abandon the Christian life. Uh, they see the cost as being too high, the demands too great. And when all is said and done, uh, they, they see the Christian life uh, as being essentially pointless. And they're inclined then, consequently, to stop running. So that's the danger. That's the danger. That was the danger for the Hebrew Christians. That's a danger also uh, for Christians today. Notice what the writer to the Hebrews adds to that warning. 
He says, make straight paths for your feet, lest that which be lame be turned out of the way. And then concludes with these words, but let it rather be healed. And perhaps our initial thinking might be that the answer to the problem would be, in fact, for God to take away the suffering and affliction, to remove those things that cause our hands to hang down and our knees to become feeble. Simple. That would be an easy way in which to uh, remove the problem. That would remove the obstacles uh, that have been placed in our path. Uh, to take away those things that discourage and dishearten us and which cause us to tumble and even to fall. But when you think about that, if the Lord was simply to take those things away, uh, that would be a very temporary healing. In fact, it would be uh, no true healing at all. And that would become obvious the very next time we were called upon to endure any suffering or affliction. The next time we encountered suffering and affliction, we would again find our hands hanging down and we would find our knees becoming feeble. You see, brother, it's not the circumstances, it's not the circumstances of our lives that need to be changed. It's not the sufferings and afflictions that we experience that need to be taken away. Removing the sufferings and afflictions will not bring about the healing that each and every one of us require. The problem is not with the sufferings and afflictions. But the problem lies in how we view and how we deal with the sufferings and afflictions that God sends upon us. That is what needs to be healed. That's what needs to be addressed. What needs to be addressed is the cause of our lameness. What needs to be addressed is the reason why our hands hang down and our knees become feeble. What needs to be healed are those inner attitudes of heart and mind that lead to our hands hanging down and our knees becoming feeble. Or to put it another way, it is our perspective of suffering and affliction that needs to be addressed. We need to recognise those things for what they are. We need to grasp what God is actually doing when he sends suffering and affliction upon his people. The tendency, as I say, is for us to uh, resile from that suffering and affliction, not to embrace it, not to see it for what it is, but to bemoan the fact that God sends those things. And that's our fundamental problem. The fundamental problem here is our failure uh, to recognise those things for what they are. And accompanying that is our failure to trust in and to submit to God's providential dealings with us, as providential dealings as they are manifested in our sufferings and afflictions. We need to remind ourselves God is at work in our sufferings and afflictions. And it's for that reason that we, uh, when, when those things come, we ought not become despondent. Despondency in such circumstances is the natural response but it's not the response of the child of God. We are to be those that recognise those sufferings and afflictions as the tender, loving care of our Heavenly Father. And we need to remind ourselves of that. To recognise those things are sent for our spiritual benefit and welfare. They're actually sent for our spiritual healing. And the suffering and affliction that God sends he is actually teaching us and he is actually, through those sufferings and afflictions, he is actually spiritually healing us. The very thing that causes our hands to hang down and our knees to become weak is also the source, the very source of our healing.
those events and circumstances, as hard as they may be, are designed to strengthen our hands and to build up our knees. That's what God intends. That's why, in fact, he sends the suffering and the affliction. He sends suffering and affliction not to punish us, but to spiritually heal us. And he sends those things so that we might be spiritually strengthened and that we might come to the realisation of what he is actually doing in and through those things and that thereby we might be enabled to run the race that is set before us. Can the healing process be painful? Uh, yes, it can. At times, extremely painful. But is the healing process necessary? Absolutely. As God reveals these things to us, brethren, so it is that we are enabled to lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for our feet. That, brethren, is the key that opens every door of Doubting Castle and which enables us to escape the clutches of giant despair and to walk again on the King's Highway. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a brief word of prayer. Would all of us experience uh, suffering and affliction and the natural response at times to suffering and affliction is to become discouraged, despondent, to have our hands hang down, for our knees to become feeble, for us to cease running the race that has been set before us. It all seems too much for us. At times we can't really comprehend why it is that you send uh, these difficulties, these trials. And yet what uh, the writer of the Hebrews reveals to us and the Holy Spirit through him is that these uh, sufferings, these trials, these tribulations are sent by you in order that we might be actually strengthened and that we might grow in grace. We might prefer what we would see as an easier way but this is the way that you have ordained and it's the way in which, which enables us uh, to run the race and to run that race unto the end. So Lord, uh, strengthen us in the midst of our circumstances of life. Our lives are many and varied uh, and, and yet there's a similarity in these things. There's no one here tonight uh, who is a true child of God, uh, who is not confronted uh, by the sufferings and afflictions of this life. Hear our prayers, Lord, and strengthen our hearts. In this we pray for our Lord's sake. Amen.